Hi everyone, I'm Bill Harden, a games user researcher at Amazon Games. My talk is titled, Not Just for Climbing, Ladders and Games User Research, a flexible framework to unify stakeholders and shift from a game features to player needs mindset. To the right of the screen are various ways to reach me if you'd ever like to get in touch about anything related to games user research. I'll be starting with a little background into games user research early in development and how getting involved earlier uh, can help increase the impact of your team. I'll then outline a process we've been implementing at Amazon Games in an attempt to get involved earlier, uh, which is heavily focused on player needs and motivations. However, the main focus of this talk will be on an interview technique called laddering. I'll touch on its underlying theory, as well as how a typical interview session, data collection, and visualization can look. After that, I'll discuss a bit about the disadvantages and the advantages of this method and when it might be best utilized during the development process. Lastly, we'll wrap things up with some main takeaways from laddering and how you can benefit from it. A lot of companies primarily rely on large-scale market research early in development before there is something already built that can be evaluated. One example of this is concept testing, where you might put early game assets like concept art or a description of the game in front of your target audience to gauge interest and collect early feedback. During some earlier stages like concept exit or prototyping stages, expert reviews or an analysis of the game or prototype based on previous game experience, best practices, and industry conventions can be conducted by the games use research team. Evaluating game features and game loops to identify areas of potential player frustration and innovation or risk. Whether working with one small team or multiple large teams as a games user researcher, odds are that you're going to work with a team that has multiple diverse philosophies regarding creative direction, what players might want out of a game, or assumptions about how players will play and interact with their game. Many teams can default to thinking of features they want in their game based on other games, but sometimes struggle to think deeper about what experience a specific feature may elicit for players. Early in development, games user researchers can help teams think more about player needs and motivations rather than solely features or systems. Uh, we can challenge them with questions like, what emotions are you trying to elicit with the features or systems that you plan to include in your game? Uh, devs might say to you, we want Souls-like combat and Breath of the Wild exploration. Uh, your response might be, okay, great, what is the intended emotional experience you're trying to elicit with those features? Getting involved during these earlier stages in development can not only benefit your dev teams, the game itself, but also you as a researcher. You'll learn more about the project and accumulate more knowledge sooner, which can all be applied during later stages of research. User research is typically associated with usability testing and play testing, but generative or exploratory research can be your secret weapon to expanding both you and your dev team's understanding of their players. A framework with a generative premise we've been implementing to better understand player motivations has been in a three-phase approach that is highly collaborative and transparent. Each phase informs each subsequent phase along with dev team input and feedback. Each phase also has its own incremental deliverable, so we can continue to provide our teams with information and learnings while we drive toward our ultimate goal of creating player motivation profiles. Phase one is foundational research where we identify competitor games of interest to the dev team, then conduct a competitor analysis and provide a primarily quantitative overview of underlying motivations in these games. However, there are a lot of ways you can go about kicking off foundational research. Some resources for this stage can include utilizing Quantic Foundries dashboard or subscriptions to other vendors that can offer insight into competitor games. Alternatively, secondary research into competitor games of interest can be done without access to additional data, simply by determining the specific scope of what you're examining, and then extracting common features, experiences, and themes. After the initial deliverable and debriefing the team of the findings, an action item that typically comes out of the debrief meetings is a narrowed down list of competitors based on the competitor analysis data. 
With this, we begin phase two and conduct a deeper qualitative dive into these games to better understand how specific features are linked to player motivations and needs. This phase offers inherent flexibility in that you can go into it with hypotheses or alternatively let the features rise to the surface more organically so you can adjust it to your team's current needs. After the deliverable and debrief from the second phase, we begin the final phase, which has the primary goal of creating player motivation profiles. To do this, we create bespoke large-scale surveys for the project, which can help us better understand underlying player motivations at scale. Bespoke surveys also offer flexibility to do things like compare across regions of interest and understand how subsegments of interest might exist. Once that survey has been fielded, the final deliverable is sent to the team, which includes player motivation profiles that the team can design for. I'll do a deep dive into what we've done for phase two, where the prim primary technique used will be the main focus of this talk. Ladder interviewing or laddering is one-on-one, -on -one, in-depth, semi-structured interviews to understand primary motivations and core needs. This is a technique that's often used in broader user research, uh, such as trying to understand the reasoning someone purchased something and the needs it satisfied in that person's life. The primary objective is to go beyond the obvious why answer to why someone may have bought something, or in our case, played a specific game and enjoyed certain aspects. People often buy games with features that satisfy personal emotional needs, and they then rationalize playing by discussing specific features and functional benefits. Ladders consist of four aspects that indicate the relationship between a game's features and a player's immediate or sustained needs. Starting with tangible features, we move from the rational to the emotional throughout the interview process. Starting with features, systems, or experiences offered by the game itself that participants like and engage with. An example response may be, I like that this game has a ranking system. Features, experiences have physical consequences for players. An example response may be, the ranking system allows me to compare myself to others. As we work our way up the ladder, physical consequences have psychological consequences for players. For example, Seeing my ranking in comparison to others gives me a sense of mastery or that I'm performing well in the game. Psychological consequences are linked to immediate or sustained needs of a player's life or a desire to fulfill an intrinsic need. For example, feeling like I'm performing well gives me a sense of accomplishment or a sense of growth. That feeling of effectiveness and growth can be coded as confidence, which from long-standing research in the field we know is a core need for players. Since we've seen at a micro level what a laddering interview consists of, let's zoom out and get a bit more of a macro view of how an entire interview session can go, which typically runs about 20 to 30 minutes. Generally, they can start very similarly to any other type of interview you may have with a research participant. This includes introductions and basic rapport building, the important piece here is setting the stage and giving the participant an idea of what to expect during the session without revealing your motives or exactly how you'll be doing it. Some examples may be, some of the questions may seem unusual at times and challenge you to think introspectively about your experience, or I might ask follow-up questions to your responses that may seem like they have obvious answers. My intent with this is to ensure I'm not making any assumptions about your experiences and would simply prefer to hear it in your own words. After introductions and setting the stage, I have found it helpful to transition to talking about games more broadly and having a brief chat about their current habits and what they're playing. This can provide a good opportunity to practice a ladder on another game that they are currently playing or have played recently. This gives them an example of what to expect, as well as a chance for you to feel out how you may need to navigate the rest of the session. After a practice ladder or two, sessions will typically segue into talking about the game or games of interest, starting off with a very general, what did you like about the game? Or can you tell me about your experience with that game? It will often result in the participant laying out a bunch of features, systems, or broader experiences offered by the game. 
From there, you can follow the lottery process for each one mentioned, as well as note down others to revisit later in the interview. Then repeat this process for anything else they mentioned liking about the game. Lastly, you may have time remaining where you can probe on things they may dislike about the game. Uh, though the feedback on dislikes can be valuable, depending on your research goals, uh, it can also offer a unique perspective into their motivations that may even open up an opportunity to complete another ladder. This can also be a good time to ask if they had any unmet needs or expectations from the game. Asking something like, was there anything the game could have added, changed, or removed to have improved your experience can often unveil this information. Like many other interviews, you'll benefit from having a note-taking template as well as a loose script for how you want the interview to go. For note-taking, I've found it helpful to organize the template in the order of which you expect things to flow. So for lottery, you might break columns into something like feature, system, experience, physical consequence, psychological consequence, core, immediate, or sustained need. The rest of the script can include anything from notes on what you plan to say during your introduction and rapport building, as well as more directed questions about their gaming habits or anything else you deem important to start an interview with. Importantly, you'll also want a reliable bank of questions to help you ask why in a variety of ways. This variety will help reduce participant fatigue when going through ladders, as the main thing you're trying to learn, why is this important to you, can become repetitive if asked the same way over and over again. Some examples can include, why is it important that a game has rankings or a leaderboard? What does said feature or consequence mean to you? What is the meaning of this game having this feature or system? Getting participants to talk about features, systems, or experiences elicited by a game is the initial step in a ladder. This can typically be started with, what do you like about this game? The first step in the ladder, uncovering the physical consequences, is often easy for participants and can be probed by the interviewer with a, what do you like about an example feature? However, progressing the ladder and identifying psychological consequences and intrinsic needs can be the more difficult part of laddering. Therefore, it could be helpful to go into interviews with potential codings for psychological consequences in mind. One example is Quantic Foundry's Gamer Motivation Model, which provides a validated framework through which we can identify psychological needs. With 12 main motivations in this model, and each lying on a spectrum, that results in 24 different ways that can help you code and communicate psychological consequences within games from your interviews. Similar to coding the psychological consequences, it can be helpful to go into interviews with potential codings for high-level intrinsic player needs. More previous research can inform this, such as self-determination theory. I've found it's common for participants to speak either in the now or the long term, so it's been helpful to, to distinguish between these immediate and sustained needs. Immediate needs are things players innately desire that provide immediate satisfaction compared to sustained needs. These can include accomplishment or a sense of achieving something positive, pleasure or inner harmony, which is a sense of joy, comfort, humor, or relief from any sort of inner conflict, and presence or a sense that one is within the game world as opposed to experiencing oneself as a person outside the game manipulating controls or characters. This is very similar to achieving a sense of flow. On the other hand, sustained needs are things players innately desire that fulfill sustained individual or social desires. Self-determination theory provides a validated framework through which we can identify these needs. Competence is a strong feeling of intellect or feeling capable, effective, smart, or a sense of growth over time. Relatedness is a sense of connectedness with others, which can be real-life people or in-game NPCs in our case, and being recognized by peers, friends, or others. Lastly, autonomy is the ability to make one's own decisions and be independent. Outside of note-taking templates, question banks, and frameworks for data coding, it's beneficial to go into laddering interviews prepared to encounter different scenarios and reactions from participants. Though, of course, only practice makes perfect. 
The first one is a pretty standard one-on-one -on -one interview technique, and that's becoming comfortable with awkward silence. Don't feel the need to fill the quiet air with immediate follow-up questions. Participants will often automatically elaborate on their responses after some time, which can help provide additional insights. If you're unclear or would like more information from a particular response from a participant, it can also be helpful to summarize their response by repeating it back to them using their own words. They will often respond with additional information they did not provide initially. For laddering interviewing specifically, there are some helpful things to keep in mind during interviews. In general, if participants struggle to think abstractly and, let's be honest, on a deeper and more introspective level than is likely typical for the average player, you can ask for a personal experience or example to help them articulate consequences. For example, can you tell me about a time in League of Legends where you used or referenced the rankings or leaderboards? It's also important to not press folks too much to complete a ladder on the first try. If they cannot articulate a why for a consequence, take note of it and revisit it later in the interview. You can also have a participant think about what their experience would be like in a game if a feature or system they liked was removed. Thinking about a key feature they enjoy in a negative space can result in a light bulb moment for folks to better articulate what they like or find meaningful about something. For example, what do you think your experience would be like if the rankings or leaderboards were removed from League of Legends. What would that mean to you? Lastly, if you're the sole researcher conducting laddering interviews, do not try to code each ladder on the fly. It can quickly become overwhelming, so it's best to jot a few notes to give yourself the gist of the participants' answers, then revisit it after the interview. You want to keep as much attention as you can on the participant. It's quite exciting when you've finished all of your interviews and have coded and organized your data and are now ready to analyze it. Honestly, this is my favorite part. There are four main components that I've found really contribute to telling a compelling and actionable story from your data, which starts with your rich qualitative data set. Within that, you should be able to identify trends in key features, systems, or experiences in competitor titles, player motivations, and intrinsic needs satisfied. As you're going through your data set and ladders, it's important to keep in mind your specific project's context and any relevant design intent that you're aware of. Understanding what the developers are striving for is paramount to properly contextualizing the findings. Additionally, it's helpful to keep in mind or cross-reference any previous research done for the project. Though ladder interviews are flexible enough to be used at various points in development, they'll likely be most impactful quite early on so it's possible there isn't much previous research to lean on here. However, if you work closely with market researchers or can get access to their previous research on the project, that can be helpful in determining consistencies or trends, as well as any potential discrepancies worth noting. Lastly, a researcher's experience can be the cherry on top of this analysis. Prior research experience, as well as knowing industry best practices, trends, and genre and game conventions is invaluable. To best visualize ladders, it's been helpful to make hierarchy of needs maps. These can help make sense of raw data and visualizing trends. They may appear initially messy, but they provide a good overview and logical way to follow ladders. When communicating ladders through a hierarchy of needs map with stakeholders, it's best to make clear the trends that are not only the main trends within the data, but also the ones that are likely to be most actionable for them. Hierarchy of needs maps also offer flexibility in that if you do deeper analysis and compare and contrast differences between the games you conducted interviews for, you can provide visualizations into either converging or diverging paths within the laddering data, which can help inform where to focus ongoing development efforts. Needs maps can also ignite thought-provoking conversations between devs and help them think more deeply about player motivations, about potential unique areas for opportunity or unmet needs and problem spaces. Here, we'll look at an example of a hierarchy of needs map for Fall Guys. If you're unfamiliar, Fall Guys is a massively multiplayer party platform battle royale game. Uh, we start down at the bottom, which are the features or experiences participants mentioned during interviews. 
we can group those into categories for better organization and clearer ladder following. We can then link features and experiences to their physical consequences. We can communicate the prevalence of these links with different thicknesses and communicate the main laddering paths with different colors. If we look at the social features of Fall Guys, we can follow the ladders up, which start with playing with friends and the low toxicity of social interactions. To participants, the game offers a low stress environment due to minimal, minimal interaction with other players and a great way to stay in touch with friends and family, primarily due to its simplicity. These two physical consequences contribute to a sense of community, both personally for participants as well as within the broader Fall Guys community due to the party game atmosphere that minimizes chances for other players griefing or displaying other toxic behavior. Altogether, this sense of community fills an intrinsic need for relatedness or to develop meaningful connections with others. If we look at the rest of this needs map, the main trends include how features like short session length, cosmetic options, and the visual style provide a few different physical consequences, consequences, which all fulfill a psychological need for relaxation and being able to play based on mood. Ultimately, these all satisfy an immediate need for pleasure. Taken together, satisfying this immediate need for pleasure and a sustained need for relatedness makes Fall Guys feel very approachable, low stress, and easy to pick up and play to have a good time with friends or family who may not keep up with games that much. To give a different and more action-oriented gameplay example, let's take a look at a hierarchy of needs map for Hades. If you're unfamiliar, Hades is a roguelike action dungeon crawler game. There were two primary paths that emerged for Hades, though they shouldn't necessarily be considered in isolation because games, of course, are holistic experiences. One for the setting and aesthetic, which was how the unique art style and take on Greek mythology provided a strong sense of escapism, which ladders up to fulfill an immediate need for presence or a strong sense of being within the game world. The other is primarily reliant upon the weapon variety available and the depth and impact of items throughout your dungeon runs. Together, these allow participants to discover new ways to play and adapt strategies, which fueled a strong sense of discovery. Ultimately, this fulfilled sustained needs for competence and autonomy. Altogether, these were the main ladders or motivation paths that drove the one more run feeling participants for participants that really hooked them. You may be thinking that was a whole lot of data that sure had a lot to say with relatively small sample sizes. Trust me, there's even more to say with that data, but most of that is unfortunately under NDA. However, it's important to keep in mind that with qualitative research like this, the lack of scale and broader representation aren't necessarily bugs, they're features. We can capture very intimate and nuanced experiences this way that can be much more difficult at scale. It can also be a great supplemental way to humanize and theorize existing data you may already have. There are a ton of other advantages with this method as well. One is the flexibility offered by laddering due to its inherent exploratory nature. You can go into interviews with a plan or not by taking either a top-down or a bottom-up approach or some combination of the two. You can go, with, go in with a priori hypotheses and probing about specific features or experiences within your target games, or you can take a much more grounded theory approach and go in much more exploratory and see what organically surfaces from participants. Similarly, this can inform your decision to go in with a system for coding your data and ladders. If you don't have hypotheses, you can do more inductive coding where all of your codes can be derived from your data rather than applied with a more deductive coding approach. You can also simplify the laddering process if you so desire by removing a rung from the proverbial ladder. Maybe you only want to track features and how they link to physical and psychological consequences. Logistically, laddering interviews can be conducted both in person or remotely. These sessions can be set up easily via something like user testing or if your company runs remote user research through an internal participant database. 
both in-person and remote sessions can be conducted as a sole researcher or with another researcher who can take notes. Laddering gives user research a unique opportunity to better know their players on a very personal and granular level. Laddering outcomes can also help set an experiential baseline for your project, which can help the research team be more prepared about what type of feedback and unmet needs may come in evaluative testing feedback. Lastly, both research and your dev teams may have more novel questions after reviewing this research, which can open opportunities for even more research. On the opposite end of the spectrum, there are some limitations to consider when implementing this technique, and all three kind of feed into one another. First, it can be cumbersome and time consuming. Uh, this includes time to run interviews, code data, analyze and visualize the data. Second, it can be an unnatural way of thinking about games and their experiences for many participants. We know from playtesting that participants are generally quite good at conveying broad strokes about their experiences, but when trying to get more granular, it can be more difficult. Laddering interviews can also seem like personal tests to some participants, which may put them in defensive mode and make them not want to share their experiences and needs on a deeper level. Lastly, and interrelatedly, laddering is a skill-based technique. The quality of your data is going to be directly correlated to your interviewing skills and ability to extract needs from participants. But this should not deter you from trying, if or when you feel it may be applicable to a project. Overall, laddering offers a lot of flexibility. From the initial top-down versus bottom-up approaches to how you code and visualize the data, as well as how it can be implemented to better understand player needs across any type of game or genre. It also helps level up your research team in better understanding the space your teams are planning and designing for, which can help you better throughout the entire development process compared to design intent and keep unmet player needs at the forefront of discussions. Laddering can help you gain a better understanding of key competitor titles overall, as well as the features and systems within and how players feel they meet their needs. Research early in development can help build experiential baselines for comparison to which later, more evaluative research can be compared to. Laddering can offer such rich data that it can be helpful to other multiple stakeholders and teams such as marketing. Not only can it help inform player-centric design pillars, it can also help inform your project's unique selling points, as well as how you might communicate with players by appealing to their intrinsic needs. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, it can transition stakeholders from a game features to player needs mindset. With an appropriately collaborative research framework, you can shift stakeholders away from system-driven models or marketing-driven personas to ones actually based on player needs. This can challenge assumptions, enable deeper thinking about design, and unify teams around player-centric mindsets and help stakeholders think about games as more holistic experiences rather than features in silos. And that is all. Thank you all for listening to my talk. If you ever have any questions on this or anything else games user research related, feel free to reach out to me at this email or any of the other options on the right. Thanks again.